Hello, my geeselings. This is the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 46. And this episode is with Tim Maudlin, who's professor of philosophy at NYU. And Tim works uh, mainly, I think, in the contemporary philosophy of physics, but he's just a huge wealth of knowledge and all sorts of fronts. So not just philosophy of physics, but ancient philosophy, Newton and Leibniz, Hume, uh, philosophy of science, so much more. And so we talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, we start, though, with Tim's views on metaphysics and the priority, I guess, of physics over sort of abstract a priori metaphysics when dealing with the ontology of the world. And then we talk about a variety of other things. We talk about absolute space, absolute time, the infinity of time and space. We talk about free will. We talk about Lewis and the Humean super mosaic. And when we're talking about free will, I make the mistake of attributing something to Democritus about random swerves of atoms. And Tim rightfully points that out. And afterward, I was thinking, hmm, where did I, where did I get this in my mind? And I realized it was from a book of Daniel Dennett's that I don't know how many years ago I read six, seven, eight. So I got it wrong. It was actually Lucretius. And I'm just going to read that quote. And it's, again, if all movement is always interconnected, the new arising from the old in a determinate order, if the atoms never swerve so as to originate some new movement that will snap the bonds of fate, the everlasting sequence of cause and effect, what is the source of the free will possessed by living things throughout the earth? So this is just uh, an ancient argument, I suppose, or uh, plea or entreaty to get you to recognize that randomness isn't going to be the source of free will. Anyway, this was a, a wide-ranging episode, a really great episode, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed talking to Tim. When you were an undergrad at Yale, I saw that you, you majored in both physics and philosophy, which isn't like totally uncommon, but... What I'm curious about is, did those interests emerge independently? Or like, as soon as you became interested in physics, did the philosophical questions jump out at you? Or was it the other way around? Or how did those two go together? It was it was it was neither of those. And and uh, just to be clear, I didn't double major. Okay, I, I did a major, a single major in physics and philosophy. Oh which was great for me because it meant that, that I didn't have to do as many labs in physics as I would for, because I was terrible at labs. Um, when I, when, when I went to college, my intention was actually to become an architect and, and, and my, and my, to get my undergraduate degree in civil oh, really? engineering. Um, so none of this, but, but I was also in, People may know at Yale, they have the directed studies course, which is a kind of special program uh, about Western civilization with a, you know, uh, connected courses in history and philosophy and uh, whatever else there was. Um, and I was also doing physics and math. Because I was one of those kids in high school, I just did, you know, I, I kind of overloaded just because I was interested in stuff. And, um, and so I, I ended up finding civil engineering rather mm -hmm. boring and being uh, naturally drawn into philosophy. And, and I was doing Greek at the time. Um, and I also had interest in physics and so on. And as I say, I kind of didn't want to do a full physics major because of all the lab stuff. And by doing a joint degree, um, I mean, I did as, as much philosophy as you would have needed for a philosophy degree, but I also did enough physics to get the, to get the joint degree. And as I often say, if you're interested in physics, 
often it's from a foundational standpoint, right? I mean, most physics, most kids who go into physics aren't thinking, gosh, I just am really fascinated in, um, I don't know, uh, condensed matter physics. Mm-hmm. Okay, they, they, they go in thinking, I really want to know what the physical world is at a fundamental okay. level. And, and that's a philosophical sense of curiosity. So there's the idea that you kind of want to get to the bottom of things in the way that physics is more at the bottom than chemistry is and chemistry is more at the bottom than biology is, which is not to disparage those disciplines, but there's a sense in which you think that biological behavior results from chemical structure and chemical structure results from physical structure. If you have that kind of, I want to go deeper, deeper, deeper idea, um, you end up in physics often in the sciences and you end up in philosophy just in general. So the, they go naturally together. You know, so you mentioned that you were doing Greek as well. So I, I, and you had civil engineering going on and then math. So, and you wanted to be an architect. So I, I take it that you had a lot of interests going on at that point. And I mean, you said that's why you overloaded on stuff yeah, in true. Um, high school, mm-hmm. but was it like Aristotelian physics or what was the first philosophical aspect of physics that um, jumped out at you when you started studying it philosophically? No, it wasn't, okay. Aristot- it wasn't okay. Aristotelian physics. And, uh, uh, and, and I'll register one of my little pet peeves, which is that although we always talk about Aristotelian physics from this, you know, manuscript that comes down to us called Tafusika, Mm -hmm. bad translation. Um, It it really, what, what, what that manuscript is about and what we would translate it for anybody else, but Aristotle is nature, Mm -hmm. right? So that manuscript is really on nature. It's about natural science. Um, you know, I, I like to say that that uh, Diane Fossey is certainly a, phys- a naturalist, but not a physicist. We, I mean, we wouldn't say that nowadays. If you want to understand what Aristotle was interested in, he was in he was in natural natural objects. Anyway, um, no, it wasn't that at all. I, I got interested. I was reading Greek for reasons that you know, forty years ago, people would have remembered that there was a big thing about. Leo Strauss and Straussianism, and there was stuff going on when I was an undergraduate. And the Straussians would always complain that if you weren't reading the original Greek text of Plato, you weren't really understanding it. <laughs> um, and and so I started taking Greek to get direct access to the text. It had nothing to do with okay. physics at all. Um, and but. I, I did take a course in philosophy of science um, that was taught by Nancy Mall, and that you know I, I enjoyed that a lot. So, and she actually suggested that I apply, which I never would have thought of uh, apply to the uh, history and philosophy of science program at the University of Pittsburgh, where I ended up going, just because my interests in philosophy were centered a bit around philosophy mm-hmm. of science. Well, you've also already mentioned foundations. And when I was talking to David Albert, uh, who who's he was on the podcast once with Justin Clark Doan, who I'm guessing was one of your students at, at some point um, when he was at. No, not, not to oh, my really? knowledge. No. Okay. Well, he was on once and then I spoke to him once and independently. And he said that he conceives of theoretical physics foundations of physics philosophy of physics and metaphysics as lying sort of on a spectrum in that order with theoretical physics on the one hand and metaphysics on the other end i'm wondering because i want to get into your book the metaphysics within physics i'm wondering if that's just sort of how you Mm -hmm. see roughly the relationship between those uh four disciplines even though they're not no no i i wouldn't i wouldn't put them on a i I mean i'm not quite sure i'd have to understand what the spectrum Mm -hmm. is but i wouldn't put it that way um metaphysics again now i'll go back to aristotle right the thing we call metaphysics 
is whatever Aristotle was doing originally in a manuscript that came down to us as ta meta ta fusica, mm -hmm. but Aristotle himself in that manuscript never uses the term right. metaphysics. So he, he wouldn't know what you were talking about if you said, oh, what's your metaphysics, right? So then you have to ask yourself, well, what is that, what is that manuscript about? And he calls it three different things. He calls it first philosophy, um, which doesn't tell you much about its content. It helps to know that second philosophy is, again, on nature or the physics. Um, and he calls it theology, which doesn't help us at all at this point. Uh, and he calls it this, the, the, the study of being, qua being, right? Um, being as such, of things that exist simply insofar as they exist. So it's the, it, it's the analysis of the most generic uh, aspects of being, right? Take everything that exists and then put it in their most, the most generic categories. Um, and of course, among the things that exist are physical things or things in space and time or, you know, perceptible things. And so that part of metaphysics that is interested in that is theoretical physics, right? I mean, I, they're, they're, they're not different disciplines. Now, it, it turns out at this moment in history that the physicists have, to a large extent, either abandoned or are not very good at addressing directly the question that Aristotle was interested in, which is fundamentally what exists. And they tend to get a little, a little sketchy um, when you try and pin them down on exactly what their physical theories postulate to exist. But that, that's a kind of historical accident. Um, you know, Newton was very clear about what he was postulating. Um, and, and other physicists earlier on were t tended, tried to be quite clear about what they were postulating. And that got a bit messed up by quantum mechanics. So I think of foundations of physics as part of metaphysics. It's not all of metaphysics unless you're a materialist. Um, but if you believe, say, there are mathematical entities that, that are not physical entities, then it's not all of metaphysics. Um, philosophy of science covers not just physics, but of course, the special sciences and biology and, and psychology and economics, maybe, if it's a science. And so it, uh, it has other issues um, because some of the some of the sciences do not deal in fundamental entities. They, they deal in clearly what are derivative or composite entities. So, yeah, there are issues about general scientific methodology that go beyond physics. But I can't quite put them on a, on a line. I can't line them up uh, linearly in the way you suggested. I think the connections between them are a bit more complicated and go off in different directions. Sure. <clears throat> and your thesis uh, in the book, I think it's, it's laid out. I mean, so it's, it's a collection of essays, right? So it's not, it's not just right. us. It doesn't have right. a thesis. But in the right. introduction, you mentioned that, or what you say, the basic idea is simple metaphysics insofar as it is concerned with the natural world can do no better than to reflect on physics. So yeah, you have, I mean, most, I think contemporary metaphysicians, I think you mentioned Kant, who's not a contemporary, but they put metaphysics before physics, whereas you conceive of metaphysics as reflecting physics. Is that uh, pretty mm -hmm. accurate? Yeah, and and as as I always say, you know the the bad guy in this story is Kant, right? Kant is where everything okay. went wrong, <laughs> because Kant um, insisted that metaphysics had to be a priori and independent of experience. And if you say that, then of course physics can't be part of metaphysics because all the grounds we have to believe in physical theories are empirical. Um, now that as far as I can tell, was kind of an invention of Kant. And if you run with that, then, of course, you're going to think physics can't have anything to do with metaphysics if it must be a priori. But uh, Aristotle didn't think that, for sure. 
Aristotle would have said, may have said that that metaphysics, as it were, that that subject matter should be about necessary truths. But but Aristotle would have kind of would would have agreed with Kripke, I think, when Kripke says, um, you know, if it's the case that water is H two O, that's a necessary truth. But it's not in you know our our access to that is not independent of experience. Right? Um, so the the alignment of the necessary and the a priori, as far as I can tell, was pretty much cemented into place by Kant, and then and then a lot of the logical positive reaction, which was rejecting all that, was rejecting Kant. Um, and you finally found your way back with Kripke and separated modality from epistemic status and so on in a proper way. Well, one thing that that you uh, say in your book, I think, is that metaphysics is fundamentally about ontology. And in this sense, mm-hmm. I, I can see why, it, since physics is about, in many ways, what what there is and how those things are related, how they work, why then um, metaphysics would reflect physics. But some aspects of metaphysics, like, uh, so questions of modality, possibility and necessity, uh, or free will, these are often construed as part of metaphysics as well. And I don't, and they're not necessarily about ontology. Uh, And so I wonder if you think that those two should be reflecting physics? Um, well, I, I, I'm not quite sure why one would think even the issue of free will often is tied to ontology in the sense that some people reject, think they have to reject materialism as an ontological thesis in order to make room for free will. That's sort of, you know, where, why there's such a big deal about it is people who, who think uh, maybe following Descartes that they need uh, a non-physical kind of substance okay. mm-hmm. of, of a soul um, in order to have free will. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's sort of the nub of, you know, one of the nubs of the problem is people who think, well, ultimately... In some sense of ultimately, I'm just a physical thing, right? My existence is determined by the physical state of my brain some way or other. And, and, and if my brain, you know, falls apart and doesn't function, I just don't exist anymore. Um, that there can't be an afterlife. I can't have a further, you know, uh, consciousness or awareness if my brain doesn't function. Because ultimately, I've got a, a, a materialist, in some sense, a materialist ontology. Um, and Descartes, I mean, one of the things he's trying to argue is that that's not true. He's trying to argue that you can survive your death or the death of your body um, because there has to be a separate non-physical substance involved. That's clearly metaphysics, right? That's just straightforwardly what exists and what's what of the things that exist are dependent on what things, what in what things are fundamental and don't depend on anything else. Um, there's a little bit of, of conceptual stuff around the problem of free will. I think the problem of free will was solved um, by, by Locke and Hume. So I just don't understand all the hue and cry about it. Oh, wait, what, um, what, what was their solution? Or when you say that you think it's solved, what is the solution? I mean, their solution was first of all that the that the phrase "free will" is a is is a bad phrase um, because it's not the will that's free; it's the person that's free, um, or not free. Right? If you're a prisoner in chains, then you're not uh-huh. free, and you cannot act freely. Um, and that to say something is an act of free will is more or less to say, first of all, it was voluntary, which is a statement about. You know, when I sneeze, it's not voluntary. There was no act of volition, mm. right? It's involuntary. So we, we understand that distinction pretty well, right? My, my heart beating is not voluntary. I can't just decide to stop it and stop it. That's, it's not that hard to understand that, um, what a voluntary act is. And it's not hard to understand what it is for someone to be free or not free to do something. Um, if you're a prisoner and in chains, you're not free to do lots of things. Um, and 
and that's kind of all there is to it, right? I mean, if someone is is free to do various things and then they act voluntarily, that's an act. Well, of free it seems will. like most m- most possible? of the worry though is about whether or not this freedom is, in a sense, an illusion because the purportedly free acts were predetermined uh, by the laws of physics or the deterministic universe. But I suppose they were. I mean, I, I, see, to say they were predetermined by the laws of physics, if I'm, if I believe in materialism, I am ultimately a mm-hmm. physical thing. So, of course, if they were predetermined by me, in some sense, they were predetermined by the laws of physics because I am a physical thing. I mean, suppose I'm just trying to decide what to have for dinner tonight, and I reflect on it. Right? I don't. I don't. I. I deliberate about it. I consider various possibilities, and I weigh those possibilities, and I, you know, all these considerations, and I come down on and say, well, you know, given how I feel and that it's raining out, and I don't want to go that far, I'm going to go to such and such a restaurant, and then because I'm free. I'm not a prisoner in chains. I get up and go to the restaurant. Okay. <laughs> That's an act of free will. Now, underlying all that is a bunch of physics. Yeah. So mm. what? It doesn't mean the physics decided. I mean, what is, that doesn't even make any sense. I decided. Right. I decided by deliberating. Now, if I do things without deliberation, like sneezing, then I'm not, I'm not willing them. They're not voluntary acts, and therefore they're not acts of free will because my will is not involved. I mean, it was a little easier when people were using a, a kind of faculty psychology, and they said, well, one of the faculties in your, in your psyche is will. And so you can just trace certain things you do to the will, and then there are other things you do that get traced somewhere else. And, you know, psychology is more complex than that then the faculty psychology is a very idealized and simplified picture. But for, for everyday purposes, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. If I can't deliberate, right, if, if it never even crossed my mind that there were different options, then, of course, I didn't deliberate and choose among those options, and then I wouldn't really say I did it voluntarily, mm-hmm. right? To, to, to say you do something voluntarily means before your mind you had various options and you chose among them. Um, and, and, that, and we reflect that in the law, right? That's why if you kill, you know, hit someone or, or, or harm them in hot blood and, and, and enraged, um, that's kind of a defense. Whereas if you were cold blooded, it means, no, you were calculating. You knew what you were doing. You understood you had various options and you chose between them. But if you were in a blind rage, you didn't really choose between various options that you considered because you were out of your mind. And that's a kind of partial defense. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. That's pretty clear. What's the problem? Mm-hmm. Either, either the person considered various options and chose among them or they didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, th- there's nothing puzzling about that. And I don't need a, a Cartesian uh, immaterial substance in order to understand mm-hmm. that. No, I, I, I'm a, a quote unquote, compatibilist as well so I, i'm in i'm in yeah. entirely in agreement with you so, yeah i mean that's where i am and i think you know when when Locke and hume talk about this they kind of just hit those notes and you say okay that settles that right what's all mm-hmm. the fuss about and we all know that there's this deep puzzle about how there could even be a problem because people often start out saying well if physics is deterministic how can there be free will and then you say, well, what if physics is indeterministic like it might be? And then you immediately say, well, right, that doesn't help, right? right? <laughs> and if it doesn't help, then, then determinism wasn't the problem. Do you want to ex- explain really quickly why it doesn't help? Because if, if physics is indeterministic, it doesn't give me free will. It just means I'm going to do if, – if my brain works in such a way that whether I go to this restaurant or that restaurant, is actually a matter of some indeterministic quantum event. It means that which one I go to has no explanation. It's not that I chose it. It's that, you know, you got to a certain point and then my brain could have jumped either way and completely randomly with no explanation at all, it jumped one way yeah, rather I think, than another. I think How that was that even um, known by Democritus. I think he said something to that effect, like sure. a random swerve because of an atom. Like it's, yeah. that, how does that give me freedom? 
Well, I mean, Democritus had a different I mean, De Democritus put his swerve in because if he didn't have swerves, nothing would ever happen. Everything would just be falling forever. Uh, in, in his picture, all these atoms would just be falling through mm -hmm. through the void. And he needed the swerve um, to get things bouncing, you know, knocking into each other. It, it wasn't for Democritus. It wasn't an issue mm -hmm. about free will. I um, mean, the swerve is well before you're talking about um, the actions of humans or anything else. Um, the, 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 the kind of apparent swerve associated with free will is, is more like what Descartes had in mind, right? Descartes sort of thought if I could take a microscope and, and follow what's going on in your brain, um, the laws of physics would be perfectly fine and make all of the correct predictions until I got somewhere in the middle of your pituitary gland. And then all of a sudden where there's this uplink to your immaterial soul, um, some of the atoms would swerve in ways that reflected your conscious decisions to do things and could not have been predicted by physics. Um, so that seemed to have been Descartes' picture. And that just seemed, you know, that just strikes us as kind of lunatic, right? Nobody thinks, as far as I know, that if you probe inside a human cranium, at some point you'll find a place where standard physics breaks down. One uh, view that I've seen attributed to you that I find particularly interesting because my uh, my main interests are in the philosophy of math is the view called mathematicism in the philosophy of physics. And I guess I should ask you first, if in your own words, uh, what is mathematicism? And if, if that's not a word that you chose for yourself, it, it, it's not. I've never even heard it before. So you're going to have to okay. tell me what mathematicism is. If, if it's the view of Max Tegmark, I absolutely do not espouse it. Okay, so sure. So the sure view that I've, uh, well, I think it's a, it, it's a quote from you, which is that the physical world literally has a mathematical structure. Yes, it has a mathematical. Okay, yeah. Structure. So that's that's yes. the view that I'm so, attributing to you. Okay. I mean, you need to be careful. I mean, Max tries to argue that the physical world is just mathematic is a math is just mathematical mm -hmm. that strikes me as again kind yeah, of yeah i've never heard of that view um, could you explain what that is before i mean not before but also uh, who is sure. I mean, max, who is max tegmark max tegmark max tegmark he's a physicist at mit and he wrote a book about different levels of kind of multiverses and 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 for him the really highest level of a multiverse is one where you say look, the physical world just is a mathematical object and all of these mathematical objects exist. I mean, I, I mean, think of solutions to, to Newtonian dynamics as mathematical solutions, mm -hmm. right? Suppose I write sure. down Newton's laws of motion as differential equations. And then I say, well, as a mathematical fact, here are all the solutions. Good. Uh, and nobody's going to disagree with that. They're going to say, okay, you've got a good piece of mathematics here. These are definite dif differential equations. They have definite solutions. Here's the set of solutions. Um, the normal person would say, but none of these corresponds to any physical reality, right? Physical reality is not Newtonian. Right. And these are, this it's is a, just it's math. It's maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, Max wants to say, no, they're all physically real. It's, it's kind of almost like Lewis's it's almost like Lewis's plurality of worlds, only Lewis is not using mathematics. Is this objects. a some variety of like an indispensability thing? No, it's just it's just a kind of very weird view about on about physical okay. ontology. It's sort of saying physical ontology is just mathematics. Not what I say is that I, I think physical reality is describable, right, by mathematics. Okay, so maybe that among all the infinite number of mathematical structures there are, there is one which will correspond to the actual physical structure of the world, right? Now, that might not be true. People have imagined maybe physics just can't be described mathematically. Maybe mathematics doesn't give us the right representational resources mm -hmm. to describe the physical world. I, I believe it does. Um, and a lot of my arguments recently have been if you think that, and I do, which part of mathematics seems to give you representational tools 
that you could understand why they're good at representing the physical world? And the answer to that is geometry, much more than arithmetic um, and algebra. So Tegsmark's view then maybe not uh, based on indispensability is just a very radical uh, contemporary Pythagoreanism or something like that. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly like that. Um, right. So that, that's a, I mean, that's a metaphysical doctrine that says physical reality is just part of mathematical reality. I don't believe that at all. I think there's a physical reality. It's not mathematical, but it is describable, okay. right? Mathematical. That's what it means to have a mathematical structure, to be describable in this way. Yeah. Okay. Well, this, yeah. the, the, this leads into exactly what I was wondering. I was wondering if you were going to be saying that your view of physics, because the world has a mathematical structure, uh, commits you to a metaphysical position in which you're a realist about mathematical objects. But it doesn't seem that way. It just seems like you would want to say that math is just a linguistic tool for describing the world. Well, I mean, I want to say oh, both so those things. Did. That is, all right. <laughs> in the philosophy of mathematics, I'm a Platonist, as oh, you, we would oh, normally you are. be called. Okay. Right. I think they're mathematical facts. I don't think they're physical facts. I think no matter how the physical world could be quite different and it wouldn't make a speck of difference to mathematics. I think that mathematical facts outrun theoremhood in any system, as Gödel showed. I mean, Gödel just proved it. I don't know why there would be any question about that. Um, so there are mathematical facts. They are not physical facts. They're necessary truths. We have some amount of access to them, interestingly. Um, we don't have access to all of them, as, as Gödel proved. And that among these infinite number of mathematical structures that Platonistically exist, okay some one may be the right have the right structure or maybe several depending on how the representation relation goes to represent the physical structure of the world okay now now i'm very curious so you're not a physicalist or not not in the sense i i'm not a physicalist certainly i think that mathematical truths are not physical truths and mathematical objects are not physical objects sure I'm not a physicalist huh. in terms of math. Okay. math my, my, I don't have a very sophisticated philosophy of mathematics, but for sure, I, I and all the mathematicians I know who are really mathematicians are, are Platonists and not physicalists about mathematics. Okay. I, that, that's not really the experience that I've had from, I mean, from speaking with mathematicians, I generally get the sense that they're they conceive of mathematical objects as having a platonic existence when they're working on math, but when they're not like, it's not the work week, they, they don't really think that these objects do have an abstract existence in some sense. So like Heim Gaifman is the main person that I worked with when I was at Columbia and he mm -hmm is absolutely not a Platonist, and he thinks very seriously about the philosophy of math. He thinks that there are mathematical truths, but this is distinct from there being mathematical objects. What, 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 what are the things that make the truths true, then? That is a good question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the central question. I mean, look, it, 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 I mean, you have a couple issues here. One is if a mathematician in is six days out of seven acts like a Platonist and reasons like a Platonist, um, and, and on the seventh day they, uh, they assert they're not a Platonist, it's not quite clear what they really mm -hmm. are, right? Um, you know, a lot of their practice, you may say, really, you're a Platonist. You just, you're just embarrassed to admit it. Um, you know, the, the people I talk to, like Shelley Goldstein at Rutgers and so on, who are very reflective about uh, the philosophy of mathematics. And, and quite honestly, I think most mathematicians are not just the way most physicists are not reflective about the, you know, foundations of physics. Um, 
are explicitly Platonistic and, and, you know, the, so uh, I'm not saying every, you know, every, every mathematician is, but the ones I hang around with who tend to also be very interested in foundations of physics, pretty much uniformly are Platonistic, pretty much uniformly believe that, for example, the axiom of choice is just true. <laughs> um, it's just a fact of uh, believe that, um, well, the continuum hypothesis is either true or false, mm-hmm. but often are not really sure which it is. So these are these are the kinds of opinions that a Platonist will hold. Um, if someone says, oh, there's just no fact about the axiom of choice or there's no fact about the continuum hypothesis or God knows what, there's no fact about Goldbach's conjecture. I don't know. I mean, it's very, you, you know, there are a whole series of escalating examples, starting with Goldbach's conjecture and so on. Normally, it's very hard to find a, a, a mathematician who would deny that there isn't a fact about Goldbach's conjecture, even if it turns out to be unprovable, right? So that takes you out of the idea that mathematical truth is theoremhood, which is pretty much what I take Girdle to have proven. Mm -hmm. So if mathematical truth isn't theoremhood, what is it? Mm -hmm. I think, well, there, you know, there's mathematical structure. There is the structure of the, uh, of the natural numbers and there are facts about it. And some of them we can figure out and some of them we can't. Most of them we can't. Most of them are just trivia, right? Now, is this though, your, your opinions on the philosophy of math, is it an exception to your belief that metaphysics fundamentally reflects physics, or do you hold your beliefs about the philosophy of mathematics or mathematical structures because of your beliefs about physics? No, they're completely independent. But if you, if you go back to that quote you Mm -hmm. read, what the quote says is that foundations of physics deals with that part of metaphysics that's concerned with physical existence that's not to say there wasn't uh, there aren't other things that exist that are not physical i think mathematical items exist and they're not physical so physics doesn't shed light on mathematics Mm -hmm. interestingly mathematics seems to provide us the right representational resources to describe physics the physical world right that's an interesting fact but neither of these drove the other. I mean, I've always been a Platonist about mathematics. I don't quite understand how anybody can be anything but a Platonist about mathematics. Mm. That's quite independent of anything to do with physics. Mm. So one of the, well, shifting gears slightly, one of the essays in your collection of the metaphysics within physics is called Why Be Human? And Mm -hmm. I was wondering if we could talk a bit about Hume, the Humean super mosaic, David Lewis, and your efforts to sort of undermine or pick apart this position. So maybe we should start with, well, I don't know, where where would you like to start? What what does it mean to be a Humean to begin with? Well, I I think, I mean, the, the, the title of that talk, of that paper, is because I understand why Hume was a Humean, Mm -hmm. okay? I mean, Hume was a Humean because he had a very specific account, which is basically the empiricist account of where ideas can even come from. Um, And it was an empiricist account. And if you have that, then there's a certain uh, very strict limit on the sorts of thoughts you can, coherent thoughts you can even have, right? Right. And you know, this was a lot of the empiricist worry was that philosophy involved language, terms that had been introduced with no accompanying ideas. So it was just, you know, mere flatus vocus, right? It was just mere breath that people would be arguing about these words, but the words had no attached clear ideas. And so it was just a waste of time. Uh, but they arrived at that by, by postulating a very specific account of how we got ideas and what ideas were and that the the scope of our ideas was fundamentally limited by the scope of our impressions um, and our sensations. Um, Now, the thing is, I don't think anybody believes that anymore. I don't think anybody holds a classic empiricist theory of 
concept formation. And if you don't, then a whole bunch of problems that were problems for Hume and for Locke just don't necessarily seem like they're problems anymore. I mean, when Hume worries so much about the notion of causation and of the necessity that's involved in causation, it's because he's an empiricist and he can't figure out what aspect of your experience would have given you that idea, how you could have even derived the concept from your experience, right? And if you held that view of concepts, yeah, that's a big problem because I can see that A, I can just experience that A follows B, but I can't experience that B necessitated A, right? I I can see the, the temporal sequence and I can see the temporal sequence happen over and over again, but there's no content of my experience that's, that's the necess- necessary connection between them. That was Hume's problem. But nobody believes that anymore. Nobody believes that concepts have to be derived from experience in that way. For good reason, because it, it, it's, it's such a straitjacket on our conceptual resources. I mean, this is more or less what Hume figured out. Um, that it makes everything extremely problematic. And and I don't think, you know, the the logical empiricists tried to pick up this idea and develop it in a kind of more systematic way using the resources of predicate calculus. And they failed. And they understood that they failed. They couldn't give decent accounts of dispositional terms. They couldn't give decent accounts of many of the concepts that appear in physics. And they eventually gave it up because they couldn't make it work. So the question that I have is, I understand given Hume's commitment, my Hume was a Humean. I don't understand how all of that becomes like Lewisian Humeanism. And so what what then is Lewisian Humeanism? Well, you know, Lewis, Lewis is, says, oh, he, you know, the one tagline he picks up from Hume is, there are no necessary connections in nature, and therefore he thinks it's problematic how there could be laws. Right? What kind of things are laws of nature? They're, they're supposed to be the things that provide a kind of causal necessity in the world. Right? When, I, when I let go of the heavy object and it falls, it's not merely a, a temporal succession. I let it go, and and then it happened to fall. It's that somehow the letting go of it caused mm-hmm. it to fall, and that, and that it wouldn't have fallen had I not let go of it, and blah blah blah. And and Lewis um, gets worried about that. So he, his route is sort of through. I'm worried about what kind of thing laws of nature can be from a kind of quasi-Humean perspective, but it's not an empiricist perspective because Lewis does not restrict himself to empiricist an, an empiricist restriction on his concepts at all. And then he just ends up in this kind of weird idea that the one thing he's happy with is the idea of this yeah. Humean mosaic, yeah. that, that you have just the physical world is something laid out in an external structure of space and time. And the only thing laid out there are what we now call local beables, little, little, you know, point like facts that all exist independently of each other. Um, and that then, Hume, you know, Lewisian Humeanism is to say, all right, that's what I'm going to allow myself at a fundamental level. That doesn't contain any laws right. at a fundamental level. So I need now to provide an analysis of, given one of these mosaics, how, you know, does that make claims about laws true and which ones and so on? And I just think this whole thing is completely wrongheaded. I mean, I think that there are laws and I think that the, the, what the laws are, there are facts about. And the, the facts are made true by the gnomic structure of reality, right? Part of the physical structure of reality is a gnomic structure. And the gnomic structure is not derived from the human mosaic. Okay, two, two questions that go in, in slightly different directions. But one, I, I'm very curious about your account. I mean, what, what exactly is gnomic structure? But I'm also curious about how Lewis takes the human super mosaic and gives an analysis that tells us what laws are or or how they work. 
Yeah, I mean, look, the second part about how Lewis does it, first of all, I mean, I'm not the right person to ask because I'm obviously not sympathetic to right. the project. Um, the project has troubles, internal troubles. Barry yeah. Lower has kind of tried to tweak it in various ways, especially if you want – it works best with deterministic laws and becomes more problematic if you admit probabilistic laws. He seems laws. to be your – counterpart to use a a um i I mean well barry's you know barry and david have been kind of pushing the humean the the lewisian humean line and i've been pushing back against david albert has oh yeah i didn't know that david and barry together pretty much agree on most of everything and 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 if yeah (laughs) absolutely um and I mean, Barry has been working a bit more than David directly on the philosophical part, you know, of articulating a kind of Lewisian best system analysis um, in a way he thinks works better than the way Lewis did it. But I, again, I, I'm not the right person to ask for what Lewis thought or how it works because you're not going to get a sympathetic right. <laughs> account right. of that, right? From my point of view, and this just comes from sitting in physics classes, if I just naively sit in a physics class and kind of say, hmm, what is this person telling me about the structure of reality? Well, they might tell me things like there are particles, or they might tell me there are things like electric and magnetic fields, and I might be get, get interested in what those are. They might tell me, oh, there are quantum wave functions, and I might get really interested in what those are. But for sure, one thing they tell me is that there are laws. <laughs> Right? They'll write down Newton's laws of motion. They'll write down Schrodinger's equation. And they'll say, this is the law that tells you how the quantum state evolves. And they never, ever, ever say, oh, by the way, the holding of this law itself reduces to something else. It's just one of the fundamental primitive pieces of physical structure that there is in the universe is a gnomic structure. And so this is my view. It's just picking up what you naturally take away from any physics course, uh, you know, the, the name is given to it is primitivism about laws. Don't try to reduce the laws to something else. Because, of course, everybody has to agree. It can't be that everything gets reduced to something else, right? There has to be a bottom. There has to be a fundamental level of any ontological picture. And the main question in metaphysics is where do you stop? Right. What, what is a good stopping place where you say this looks to me like a plausible, fundamental thing from which other things can be derived or from which other things can be constructed? And to me, laws look like an absolutely natural stopping hmm. place. They, they don't get an analysis in terms of something else. What Lewis wants to do is analyze them in terms of something else. Right. What makes something a law is that there is a certain pattern in the Humean mosaic. And I think it goes the other way around. I think the reason there are patterns in the Humean mosaic is that the mosaic was generated by a a, a law, right? It was gnomically generated. So, I mean, this this is going back and replaying Euthyphro again, right? Euthyphro says the pious is what's loved by the gods. And Socrates says, no, it's the other way around. It's loved by the gods because it's pious, right? It's really important to understand what explains what, what accounts for what. And for me, the laws are at the bottom and they're part of what I appeal to, to explain other things. And for Lewis, the mosaic is at the bottom and he has to appeal to that to explain the laws. And it also Mm -hmm. means that he's handcuffed because he can't appeal to the laws to explain the mosaic. Mm -hmm. And to me, that makes no sense. It seems to me that the patterns that we see in the world are the consequences of the laws, not the other way around. So, so in taking a law as primitive laws as primitive, you, and not seeking a further analysis of them, you don't ask much more about what they are than, than just taking it as, okay, they're laws. That's what they are. They're rules. I, well, I don't, I don't, I don't 
try to pursue an analysis, a metaphysical analysis of them, because I don't think the, anything primitive doesn't have a further metaphysical analysis, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you want to understand why this is a good place to stop, what you start doing is you go the other direction. You say, all right, why should I believe in these laws? Well, not because I analyze them in terms of something else you already believe in, but because I appeal to them over and over and over again in many different ways in the analysis of other things. I mean, the, the, the logical empiricist ran into a lot of trouble with dispositional terms. You know, and you see this in Goodman and you see it even earlier in Hempel. They're worried, how, how can we describe, how can we define fragility? Something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Um, and they get into a whole mess about it. If, if you ask me, why do I think, and, and then what about a dispositional term? Why, why do I, what do I mean when I say the window is fragile? My natural thing is to give you a subjunctive conditional. If you were to strike it with a hammer, it would break. Okay. And then you say, what, what makes this, what makes a subjunctive conditional true? Because it's not a material conditional, right? It seems to be about not necessarily how the world is, but how it would have been. And to me, the answer to that is clear. What makes the subjunctive conditional true are the laws. Why would that window have broken had I hit it with a hammer? Well, because there are plain facts about the structure of the window in terms of being made of glass and the atomic bonds and so on. And the laws of nature tell you that if you have something with that atomic structure and you strike it with a certain force, it will fracture. What do I mean the laws tell me that? Well, I just plug this in as a, you know, as a, as a freshman example in doing physics problems, right? How much, how much forces would be? Would they be large enough to break the bonds? Blah, blah, blah. We know how to do that. We know how to do that, but when we do it, we appeal to the laws. We apply the laws to evaluate the subjunctive conditional, to evaluate what would have happened or what might happen. So the reason for believing in laws is primitive is that if you accept them and you understand how they're used, then you get an immediate handle on dispositions, you get an immediate handle on subjunctive conditionals, you get an immediate handle on counterfactuals because they're just subjunctive conditionals that happen to have false antecedents. A whole bunch of stuff that you want and that was problematic for the empiricists, just, you know, kind of roll out on your lap without much extra effort. Now, granted that physics is incomplete, uh, maybe it's something that can't be completed, I don't know. Uh, what are candidates for laws? When you, when you talk about laws, what sort of things do you have in mind? Well, the, I mean, the best physical theories we have now are quantum theory and the general theory of relativity. Um, each of those have laws. In quantum theory, there's a law that tells you how the quantum state of a system evolves. That's Schrodinger's okay. equation. And, you know, you can break Schrodinger's equation, and some people have suggested allowing it not always to obtain. That's so-called collapse theories in quantum theory. But if you can keep Schrodinger's equation, okay, that's a, a, a very clean equation. It's a very simple mathematical equation. It has these nice properties of linearity and so on. Um, if you have more than the quantum state, and I think you have to have more than the quantum state, then you need a law for it in the so-called pilot wave theory or Bohmian mechanics. That extra law is called the guidance equation. It's also pretty simple. Um, so that's another example of a kind of equation you could have. In general relativity, you have the Einstein field equations, and those look quite different. And that's why there's a problem putting relativity together with quantum theory, is that their fundamental laws just have very different forms, and they don't play together very so well. Um, I mean, these are, all, these are all things whose general form looks plausible, but, but in order to get to the final theory, which means you have a single theory, self-coherent theory that gives you everything, something's got to give. My own guess is that it's, it's, it's relativity that gives, but that, and that's what I'm working on now, but maybe that's wrong. But I, you know, there are all kinds of kind of candidates for laws 
that have the right looking form, they just don't work. I mean, they don't work universally, right? They don't work in all in all contexts. And so we know something's going to have to be adjusted. And nobody knows really exactly where that adjustment is going to fall. For the sake of argument, we can take um, Schrodinger, Schrodinger's equ equation, for instance, and assume that it's true. Uh, and you, t you would mm -hmm. take that as primitive. Uh, so, mm -hmm. but isn't, isn't it still a worthwhile or sensible question to ask why Schrodinger's equation? Couldn't it have been slightly different? What makes it the way it is? Like, isn't there some arbitrariness there? Or how do you, how do you respond to questions like that? Well, I, I think, you know, if, if you think you can always do that, you're in a mugs game because you're never going to win, right? Somebody says, I say, look, I think the bottom level is Schrodinger's equation, right? It's just a fundamental fact about the world that it behaves that way. And somebody else says, no, no, I don't like that. I want, I want an explanation for that. Well, if you think that's always a, a good worry to have, now I give you the explanation. And then, of course, they're going to come back and say, yeah, but that thing you just appealed to to explain it, what about it? And what about it? And what about it? I mean, it's just a mm -hmm. mug's game. Right, you're never so going to win. So there have to be base facts. It just tells you it's it's an unreasonable demand that there always be a further explanation. And so the the art of the thing is to is to have a reasonable judgment about where it's a good place to just stop. Now, wherever you stop, okay, maybe you stop too soon. Maybe next year somebody will come along with, as it were, a deeper theory that seems even more satisfactory that is able to derive your theory. Okay, you can never rule that out. But the deeper theory will also just have a stopping place. I mean, don't think you're ever going to get rid of there being a stopping place. Um, and and there's, there are dangers both directions, right? There's a danger if you stop too soon that you miss out on a deeper explanation. But there's the other danger that if you don't stop when you got to the bottom, you're just going to be banging your head against a brick wall for the rest of eternity because you're trying to find a deeper explanation of something for which there is no deeper explanation. Mm -hmm. So you need to, to have just some judgment, right? Some aesthetic, as it were, judgment. If you get down to something that looks as simple and straightforward as Schrodinger's equation, and you're not satisfied with that, then you'll never be satisfied, right? If, if the form of that equation isn't simple enough for you to think that's a pretty good candidate law, then I don't know what would satisfy mm -hmm. you. And you're just going to be perpetually dissatisfied. And that, you know, that's kind of a miserable situation. So, so clearly what I'm about to suggest isn't your response to this question. But my understanding is that at least some people respond to the seeming arbitrariness of the laws by taking a, a sort of Lewisian many worlds route in which there are this infinity of worlds each one has different laws so that maybe all potential law, all variations on Schrodinger's equation are instantiated. And do you not like this route yeah. because this then, uh, this again, isn't a stopping point. You then ask, well, why the many worlds? Well, uh, look, uh, now you're getting something again, it's very close to Tegmark's view where, where every mathematical object corresponds to a physical one. Right. I mean, you can see how they're similar. Mm -hmm. Why is this no good? Uh, well, first of all, you know, I mean, you really shouldn't entirely abandon your naive reaction that anybody would have that this is just an insane postulate. But let's try and say something mm -hmm. more direct. In in any intuitive sense, now Lewis makes a big deal about about cardinalities here and tries to avoid this. But in any normal judgment. Lewis, what Lewis likes about the Humean mosaic is that you get it combinatorially, right? You've got all these little local matters of fact. They're only related by these external relations of space and time. And so you can just say combinatorically, here are all of the, all of the ways you could make a mosaic, right? Under some constraints. In, in the intuitive sense, almost all of those, the vast majority have no laws. They're like, if you just randomly assign pixels to your computer screen, right? If, if every pixel just randomly got assigned one of the 
million different colors that you can put on a pixel, um, most of those would just be noise, right? They would just be kind of mush. They wouldn't be the image of anything. They would have no pattern to them at all. They would have no Humean laws. Um, so, you know, one thing one might say is, is it intuitively, if Lewis is right that all of these possibilities really physically exist, that 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 any given one would have any laws at all is, as it were, vanishingly a vanishingly small proportion. <laughs> And then it gets worse than that, because then you say, oh, yeah, but now I have kind of an anthropic reasoning that people can't exist in the random ones, right? People can't exist in the kind of fuzzy ones. But then you say, okay, but there are ones that are perfectly patterned up to any given point in time and then go fuzzy after that. And because there are an infinite number of ways they could go fuzzy, there are, as it were, infinitely more that are patterned up to a certain time and then go fuzzy than are patterned all the way through then isn't it more, much more likely in some sense that we're in one of those? And, and at any given moment, everything's just going to go right. kaflui, right? Now, you know, Lewis can kind of goes into, into defense mode and says, oh, well, how do you have these probabilities and they're all the same cardinality and blah, 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 blah. But intuitively, this is absolutely right. He, because he has no laws controlling the thing, because – the laws are consequent on the mosaic rather than the mosaic being consequent on the laws. You wouldn't expect the mosaic to ever be, as it were, patterned. And if it were patterned for a little yeah. bit, you wouldn't expect yeah. it to go on being patterned. I like patterned. this response. It's very persuasive. Right? And, but th this is what I, I just – and many people have made mm. this point, right, um, and, and tried to make it – more and more formal, but I don't think the formality is helping you much. That's just the intuition. Whereas if you start with the laws and you say, look, the reason why the mosaic that we find ourselves in is patterned in the first place is because it was nomically mm -hmm. generated by something simple like Trojan's. Well, it seems, it seems conceivable that, sure, if we were going to exist, we would be in one of the patterned places. But uh, your point about it, it ceasing to become patterned is what I find most persuasive uh because every yeah. for every one in which it's it starts out patterned uh there's infinitely more that that go to use your word uh kaflui <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah and this is i mean again I, this is not an original yeah. observation lots of people have tried to press this and i think it's right okay and I don't, I mean, the question is, what's motivating, what is motivating Lewis to be so skeptical about the idea that, that a, a gnomic structure, laws could be part of the fundamental furniture of the world? Again, I understand why Hume was skeptical, because if Hume, Hume couldn't understand, how can I even form a concept of a law, if all my concepts have to be copies of my impressions? Because I can't see laws. Right. I can look around and I can see tables and I can see chairs, but I can't see laws. But nobody's a Humean anymore about concept formation. So Hume's motivation to be Humean doesn't exist. And that's why the title of that paper is Why Be Humean? I mean, you can put yourself in the Humean straitjacket, but I don't understand why you're doing it. I understand why right. Hume did it. That's certainly not why Lewis is doing it. I mean, Lewis is Lewis is. The, the concepts that Lewis allows himself to deploy far outstrip anything Hume would have recognized, where he could trace it back to an impression, right? So he's given up the entire Humean motivation for being Humean, but then he wants to keep being Humean. And I, to me, I'm just puzzled. I don't get it. Mm -hmm. we, so we've talked about Kant's metaphysics. We've talked a bit about Lewis's metaphysics. Are there any other major sort of contemporary metaphysical practices or programs that you find misguided because they don't take uh, the empiricist approach that you advocate? Well, yeah, I mean, my approach is empir it's in a way empiricist, but not empiricist in the, you know, I was just rejecting Humean empiricism. Um, look, I, 
the basic argument, which I already gave that you noticed is metaphysics is about what exists. Some part of what exists is physical. If you're a physicist, you think all, if you're a physicalist, you think all of it is physical. I'm not a physicalist in that sense, but I certainly think a big chunk of it is physical. Um, if you want to understand or have a reasonable guess about the nature of physical reality, you sure ought to be paying some attention to physics. That seems to me trivial. Um, so I guess anybody who thinks they can usefully engage in those questions and not spend at least a little time learning some physics is on a fool's errand. I mean, I don't understand what they think the source of their information is going to mm -hmm. be about physical reality, if not physical behavior and physical theory and so on. Um, now, the, you know, the physical theory we have is not complete and we don't, and there are questions about he, how to even understand what we have. And that's what I spend my time on. But if you think you can do it all a priori in the sense of Kant, I, that's, that just strikes me as silly. Now, I don't, I don't want to put any names to that. Um, not, not cause I'm holding anything back, but I, 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 I just really don't, I'm just saying that's an approach that I think I, I, I also don't understand, right? How could you do metaphysics, especially the part, you know, the part of it that's concerned with physical reality and not care a lot about physics? I, I just don't get mm -hmm. it. Well, so if a large chunk of it is physical, of what exists is physical. So you're, I guess, mm -hmm. reductive, redundantly a physicalist about those things. Then there are the yeah. the mathematical objects and structures are there yes other things that are or exist in that you take to be like maybe fictional objects or uh impossible objects anything else you admit into sort of your inventory of the universe <laughs> i'm not sure i mean <laughs> so um fictions exist right we got whole books full of mm -hmm. them that, you know, to, to say fictional objects exist, I don't, I, I have no idea what that means. I don't, I don't know what people mean if they say, you know, the character Sherlock Holmes exists in some way that goes beyond the, the fictions that were written by Conan Doyle and maybe fan fiction later. I don't, you know, um, to say, do impossible objects exist? Well, no, right. That would just be self-contradictory because you just told me they're mm -hmm. impossible. Um, <laughs> that, you know, what, that, that was quick. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm a, a mathematical Platonist. So I think that there, there are mathematical truths that are independent of physical reality. You know, physics, if physics had been different in any way you like, it wouldn't have changed mathematics a speck. I personally believe they're also, you know, moral, they're kind of moral okay, facts. That, so, so um, you're not a, an expressivist like David Albert then? Okay. No, no. I think that, I think we have made, I think certain practices are objectively unjust, right? Chattel slavery is objectively unjust and the, the banishing of it is objective moral progress. Um, other kinds of discrimination are objectively unjust and getting rid of them means we're becoming better. Society's becoming better. And I think that's, that, you know, that's not subjective and it's just true. You, you, right? you asked me um, about the, the truth makers of mathematical, fa mathematical facts for somebody who doesn't believe in mathematical objects. What then do you take to be mm -hmm. the truth makers for the mathematical facts like those, I mean, the moral facts like those about chattel slavery. Yeah. I mean, that's, again, that's a very deep question and I, and I don't want to be flippant about it. Um, the easiest cases are ones like um, unequal treatment. I mean, look, there's an argument that Plato gives, I think an extremely important argument in Republic. When the issue comes up and you have to go back and put yourself back into ancient Greece at the time, and they say, well, gee, we're, we're building this ideal state and we're going to train some of the children in very special ways in the hope that eventually they'll become the philosopher and then come down and, and rule the, you know, rule the state. And, and Socrates says, yeah, and, you know, women should be allowed in, in, in exactly the same way. Um, there should be no gender bias, if you will, right? Women should be allowed to, to, 
to to occupy any uh, place in the society, including the highest place. And this is one of the shocking things to the people around him, you can imagine. And and Socrates says, but look, it's it's and, and they say, but isn't this contrary to what you said, Socrates? You said each person's job should reflect their nature and people with different natures should have different jobs. And Socrates says, no, no, but that's like saying if we allow bald men to be barbers, we shouldn't allow, you know, hairy men to be barbers because they have different natures. He says, no, that's not right. You have to think about what is relevant to the job, right? What are the, what are the qualifications relevant for doing the job well? And the distinction between males and females is about how they, the role they play in reproduction. So if you ask, should there be gender discrimination in jobs? It's the simple question, does the way you reproduce have anything to do with how well you do that job? To which the answer in most cases manifestly absolutely not. And so any such restriction would be unjust. It would be treating people differently on the basis of irrelevant characteristics for the purpose. Now, that strikes me as very near a theorem, right? Justice is the, is, is, is the easier case because it's just equal, equal treatment, right? Now, if someone says, yeah, but how do you know that equal treatment is good? And you, you sort of get a little puzzled. You mean, how do you know that the right thing to do to treat people who are equally well qualified for something to treat them equally? How do you know that's the right thing to do? I, you know, sort of the answer is, how is it that it's puzzling to you that it could, could, could be otherwise? Mm -hmm. Isn't that obviously the right thing to do? Now, so that seems to me to be a truth. And... If you ask me what kind of truth it is, I don't know. It's sort of baked into the concept of justice that discriminations in the law should be based in relevant discriminations in fact or something like that. I mean, it, 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 I, it's not that I have a, a well-worked-out theory of the nature of moral truth, but I have examples like this. It seems to me that's not just my opinion, and I'm not just saying, yay, boo, and it's not the case that in some other society where they decided, no, we just think it's okay to discriminate against women, or we just think it's okay on the basis of the color of your skin to make you into a slave, that, well, they were just as, you know, they were just as right with respect to their own society as we are right with respect to our own society. No, Right. It's not like we decided to drive on the left and somebody else decided to drive. Or we decided to drive on the right. And in Britain, they decided to drive on the left and nobody's more correct than anybody else. Right. There are cases like that where there's nothing in the underlying basis of reality that makes that choice. And it's clearly just a convention. And if, if you don't if you don't agree with that, I wouldn't even understand what your concept of justice is. If you think that that you know, rules like that could be just and not unjust. I'm not even sure we're having a conversation, hmm. right? I can certainly understand how having laws like that could benefit part of society, right? We all understand how slavery benefited part of society and particularly benefited the part of society that was able to make the laws. And that's why it hmm. existed. But it seems to be manifestly unjust to treat people that way. Um, and I'm more sure of that than I'm sure of any deeper account of the nature of those facts, right? What makes those facts? I, I acknowledge a puzzle there. I acknowledge if I were an ethicist, I would be spending a lot of my time trying to articulate something more detailed to say, but I'm not an ethicist. I'm just somebody who holds strong ethical opinions <laughs> about certain things. And, and they're also Platonistic, right? And it's because of that, that I think objectively, we have made moral progress in getting rid of slavery. Objectively, we have made moral progress in getting rid of certain kinds of discrimination. If somebody wants to fight me against, you know, I don't understand. I really don't. I think, you know, it seems one almost wants to say depraved to object to what I just said. Um, I can't give you a deeper account of it at this point. But I would just ask you to reflect on those examples and see if you really disagree. Mm -hmm. But I, 
I I guess I wonder though if on this account the moral facts still supervene on the physical, so it it doesn't necessitate. I mean, because I don't know what a moral object would be. So, yeah, but go back to this. Look, what I what I said about mathematics was let the physical world, you know, fall out however it falls out. I don't see how that would make a speck of difference to any mathematical mm-hmm. fact. Right? It would still be that one plus one equals two. Let the physical world fall out however it falls out. I don't see how that makes a speck of difference to the moral fact that the kinds of discrimination I just talked about are, are unethical or unjust. Okay, so maybe, okay. I mean, what, how are you going to change the physical facts that seems to have any even vague relevance to it? Sure, no, that that makes sense. Now, is that, are there any other classes, I guess, of facts in this case or objects in the case of mathematics that come to mind that are sort of independent of the physics not 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 ones that you know and maybe it's because i spend so much time with plato and you know plato plato points you to mathematics and geometry in the first place to get you to believe in the forms and then worries about the form of the good is the highest form um so outside of Platonism about mathematics and about certain ethical facts. Now, I mean, look, in the case of ethics, it's clearly it's much more problematic because you think any precisely defined mathematical question has an answer, um, but not every precisely defined ethical question. I think there are gray areas and fuzzy areas, and I don't think there's some realm of ethical truth that settles every reasonable ethical debate. And so it's it's more problematic, right, to think about the nature of ethical truth. Uh, as I say, the, the clearest ones are things that have to do with equity, because equity is almost a mathematical concept, right? Equal treatment. I mean, you literally use the word equal um, in stating what equity is. And so it's closer to mathematics, if you will. Um, but when it comes to balancing different goods and, you know, what's the right course of affairs where there all the courses are somewhat problematic and you have to figure out which is the least problematic. I don't think they're always, as it were, eternally etched answers to questions like that. Um, but outside of mathematics and, and, and ethics, I, nothing's occurs to me. I mean, um, okay. I don't I don't believe in non-physical entelechies and, you know, Cartesian souls and stuff like that. I mean, that would be another possible thing one could have, yeah. I suppose. Contingent things, changeable things in time, contingent things that are nonetheless non-physical. I guess, yeah, I guess my view is that pretty much anything I think of as contingent that could have been different, I think of as fundamentally physical. But I don't think of mathematics as contingent, for sure. And I don't think of ethics as contingent. I wanted to talk more about space and time because I looked at your your Princeton volume, uh, Philosophy of Physics, Space and Time. And I know mm-hmm. you have another one that came out in 2019 on quantum theory. But right now I want to talk about space and time. So I have a, a general idea of how people describe absolute space and how they compare it to relative space. But I'd love to hear mm-hmm. the way that you like to describe it when you're teaching a class on it for the first time? Ah, well, okay. So I would have to say to begin, I would be a little bit worried about the two terms you just used as contrast terms. Um, So there's absolutism as opposed to relationism where the absolutist This is just going to parallel what I just said about laws, where I said I take laws as primitive. I don't think they're analyzed in terms of anything else. Where the absolutist thinks, okay, there's just space-time structure. It's part of the fabric of physical reality, and it's not derivative from anything else. Right? It's part of the fundamental fabric of physical reality. And the relationist who says, no, 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 and this is more or less what Leibniz says, um, no, 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 really, there's no separate thing, space and time, which could exist independently of, say, any material content, which is what Newton certainly thought. Um, 
talk about space and time as an object is misleading. Really, all there are are relations between material objects. And therefore, if there were no material objects a fortiori, there could be no space, spatiotemporal structure, right? If there were no material objects, there could be no relations between, you know, between them because there are no such things to be relations between. So, you know, this is the first question you want to ask. Do space and time or, or, or does spatiotemporal structure, if you will, have an existence that is in principle independent of matter? So I believe that I believe that it does. I'm not a relationist of the Leibnizian sort. But um, the normal way you would state the special theory of relativity is like that, too. The special theory of relativity says, look, there's space time. It has a certain structure. It's a particular flat Minkowski structure. I give you a bunch of details about its geometry. Um, but that does not contain what Newton called absolute space. So this is where I want to be careful, right? There's one distinction, which is are you an absolutist or a relationist about space-time structure? On that side, I'm certainly an absolutist, right? I think it's part of the fundamental structure of reality. Newton believed in addition to a very specific hypothesis, which is that space has points and those points persist through time, right? They, they are, you can ask right now, which is the point of space existing now, which is the same point where, say, I don't know, the Declaration of Independence was, was signed by John mm -hmm. Hancock, you know, hundreds of years ago. Interesting. So, so that's part of Newton's doctrine that we call absolute space. I don't believe that. <laughs> well, I sort I mean, okay, for, for, for purposes of this discussion, uh, I don't believe um, that. Just, okay, at least that's something that that's something that the the theory of relativity would absolutely deny. So the theory of relativity postulates an objective space-time structure, but it's not the same one that Newton postulated. That's certainly true. And so there's a you you could easily get confused because the term absolute space sometimes means this very specific thing that Newton believed which allows you to define absolute velocities and then absolute accelerations and so on. And this other thing, which is just, is space-time structure independent of matter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, just to be clear, though, did Newton think of space, like the point where the Declaration of Independence was signed, as a sort of substance? Yeah. Newton thought of space as a, not just a substance, but a, a persisting substance, it persists through time, one in the same space, containing identically the same spatial locations, persists through time. And it's in terms of that that you define absolute motion for, for Newton, right? Absolute motion is an object changing its absolute place through time. Hmm. And you can ask over, say, the last 10 minutes in absolute space, how far did it go in what direction? That's how you define absolute velocities. Relativity gets rid of absolute velocities. It doesn't have them because it doesn't have individually persisting parts of space that persist through time. So in relativity, if you have a particle, you can't, you, and you ask, well, is it moving or is it not moving? And if it's moving, how fast, in what direction? The answer in relativity is those are not good questions, right? The, the space-time doesn't have a structure that underwrites answers to questions like that. For Newton, it did. And, and Newton has a whole argument in the scolium on space and time, the bucket argument, about why he thinks you need that, even though it's not observable. I mean, the other important thing, Newton knows perfectly well, he postulates there are absolute velocities, but he knows you can't observe them. It's a theorem that if the, if the physics is Newtonian under certain constraints, you can't observe them. But he nonetheless thinks you have to postulate that they're there to make sense out of the whole theory. Um, relativity says, no, the, the structure isn't like that. It's what is the bucket argument? 
So the bucket argument was the, the argument that Newton deployed against, I mean, specifically against Descartes and sort of against Aristotle. Um, and you have to ask yourself, all right, what, what's the issue? The issue is what is the definition of motion, locomotion? When is something moving? And what Aristotle suggests is that the motion of an object is defined as its motion with respect to what immediately contains it, right? What's immediately around it. And so if something is at rest with respect to its immediate surroundings, it's at rest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Newton says that can't be right. Why? Well, to take his example, take a bucket of water and hang it off a rope from your ceiling and twist, strongly twist the rope, right? Um, and let the whole thing come to, to come, as we would say, come to rest so that the, 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 the surface, what you can see is that the surface of the water is flat. And then suddenly spin the bucket. So it's going to, the, the, the rope's going to unwind and the bucket's going to spin faster and faster, right? And what Newton says is, okay, right after you let it go, there will be a relative motion between the water and the bucket, right? The, the water and the bucket will clearly be in relative motion. As I like to say, if, it, if you were an ant sitting on a leaf in the bucket and you looked up at the bucket, you'd see the, the, the handle of the bucket spinning around you, right? So there's clearly this relative spinning motion. But even so, the surface of the water is still flat. And then as you wait, slowly, the relative motion of the water in the bucket goes away. And after a while, as we would say, the bucket and the water are spinning together. And if you're now an ant mm -hmm. and you look up, you, you can just steadily see the, the, the handle above you. But at that point, the water now has a convex, concave surface, right? The water now, as we would say, has climbed the bucket, climbed the edges of the bucket. Even though there is no relative motion between the water and the bucket. So by, by Aristotle's telling, the water's not moving. And then in the fourth part of the experiment, as we would say, the bucket stops spinning, but the water keeps spinning. Yeah. Right. So now you've got relative motion again. The water is concave is is concave and there's relative motion. Now, what what Newton says is, look, um, Aristotle's theory. Cannot explain this. Because in the first part, before I let go of the bucket, the bucket in the water at relative rest and the water's flat. In the next phase, the bucket and the water are in relative spinning motion, but the water is flat. In the next phase, the bucket and the water are at relative rest, but the water is concave. And in the last phase, they're in relative motion, the water is concave. So the, the thing you can observe is that sometimes the water is flat and sometimes the water right. isn't. But you cannot explain that by the relative motion of the water to its immediate surroundings, namely the bucket. Because there's no, there's no correlation there. And so what Newton says is, well, what really matters is whether the water is spinning. And you say, well, spinning relative to what? And Newton's answer is, it's relative to absolute space. That spinning is an absolute spinning. It doesn't have to do with the bucket. It doesn't have to do with the water moving relative to any other material object. It has to do with the motion of the water as defined by it, its relation to absolute space and time. And, and the Aristotelian theory just can't handle that, right? It's, it's physically inadequate. And do you find the thought experiment compelling in its own right? Well, I mean, calling it a thought experiment is kind of silly in the sense that I've actually literally done the experiment, right? I do it in classes, and, and you could do it yourself if you, if you want to take half an hour. You don't have to because you know how it's going to come out, right? Sometimes when we talk about thought experiments, we talk about things you couldn't do. Right. 
but nonetheless, you have a clear a clear opinion about how they'd come out. In this case, if you're really, you know, questioning how it's going to come out, I invite you go do it, and it will come out just the way Newton says. I mean, we all know that. It seems like kind of a waste of time. It's not a thought experiment. It's an experiment. Yeah. Right. This is actual, you know, familiar physical behavior. Newton's absolutely right. That's what it does, and I think he's absolutely right to show to to, to argue that this shows a kind of independent existence of space and time from, from relations between material objects. I think he correctly knocks the relationist out, out, of, out of the running by this observation. And this has nothing to do with, you know, relativity would agree with Newton. Because as I say, relativity postulates a space-time structure that is independent of matter. And in that space-time structure, either you're spinning or you're not. It's not a relative thing. It's an absolute mm -hmm. thing. And relativity would explain the bucket experiment in exactly the same way as it were at this level, in the same way Newton does. And say relative motion has nothing to do with anything here. It's absolute motion. It's absolute acceleration. Well, the, the fact that you could do the bucket experiment in class aside... Uh, just for fun, were there actual physical experimental attempts to settle the debate between absolutists and relativists about space at this time, around this time? Well, no, because everybody, look, everybody agreed that as far as the observable phenomena go, Newton okay. was absolutely right. And, and you can go further. You can say, look, um, we have all kinds of direct empirical evidence that the Earth is spinning. Why? Well, for one thing, it's oblate, right? It's a bit fatter around the equator because it's spinning, right? And, and why is it that, that um, cyclones, you know, hurricanes go clockwise in one hemisphere and counterclockwise in the other? Well, that's due to Coriolis forces, and that's because it's spinning, right? Nobody questions that the physics distinguishes spinning or accelerated motions from non-accelerated motions. Now, the only possible response to this was the one that was kind of gestured at by Mach. And this was much later, right? This was the end of the, end of the 19th century. And Mach says, well, I don't want to believe in Newtonian absolute space and time. And you say, okay, Mach, how do you explain the bucket? And he says, well, it's because the water is spinning relative to the fixed stars, and you say, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, the fixed stars are awfully far away, mm -hmm. right? How about giving us a theory of how the relative motion of the water in the bucket here on Earth is influenced by, you know, Newton's, Newton's opinion was that if I, if I could eliminate the fixed stars, it would make no difference at all to this phenomenon because they're far away. I mean, you could calculate their gravitational influence is negligible because it's dropping off, you know, at, at, at one over R squared. Mm -hmm. Um, Mach kind of desperately needs something material and, and he fixed any kind of, you know, gestures at the fixed stars, but he never gave us a theory and no physics has ever really been developed in a Machian way. I mean, Julian Barber has been, you know, has been trying to do it, but when you, by the time he gets to trying to explain stuff like general relativity, he's completely had to shift his fundamental principles because, you know, you just need something empirically adequate. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't see the motivation, right? Why should I, th this is just like with the laws. What's wrong with thinking that sp spatiotemporal structure is just there? It's part of physical reality and it doesn't reduce to something else. It seems like a perfectly natural place to stop unless you're an empiricist and you say, oh, the problem is I can't touch mm -hmm. space. Right. I can't see it. I can't in interact with it. And so if I'm an empiricist, I might be puzzled. But nobody's an empiricist of that sort anymore. So it seems to me space time structure, just like gnomic structure, is a very natural place to end and say part of the fundamental fabric of physical reality is spatiotemporal structure. Now, that doesn't settle what it is. I mean, relativity gives you a very different account of what it is than Newton did. And I will give you a different account than relativity does. I think it's an open question what the space-time structure is. But that it is, 
And that it exists independently of the matter, it seems to me, that the perfectly natural and, in fact, the most natural hypothesis. Now, just anecdotally, since uh, it's, it's always, I always love talking to people who know the history so well, does this at all relate to the ether or the, the debate about absolute and, and relative space? Or is that something? Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it does. It, 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 it relates to the ether in the sense that... that um, Newton. Okay, so Newton has as a, a as a theorem that if all of physics is governed by his equation f equals m a, as we would say, he didn't put it that way, but as we would say, if all of physics is governed by f equals m a, and if in addition all of the forces are 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 due to things that only depend upon relative positions, the way gravity only depends on the difference di distance between two objects right and directions but then um then the absolute velocities even though they're there you can't observe them all right so this is a theorem that he proves now people got used to then saying all right so really this is what physics should be in terms of it should be in terms of this fundamental newtonian dynamical equation and forces that are just dependent on distance and not on velocity. The important thing is that if you had forces that depended on absolute velocities, then you could observe the absolute velocities. You just, you know, I mean, if there were kind of universal mm -hmm. friction that depended on your absolute velocity, you just let a particle go in a vacuum and then see where it comes to rest, right? Because <laughs> eventually the friction would bring it to rest and it would be at absolute rest. Now, um, in Newtonian physics, the absolute velocity doesn't appear in any of the force laws. But in, elect in Maxwellian electrodynamics, it does. So when you, when you, when you write down the law for the so-called Lorentz force on a charged particle in a magnetic field, um, you invoke the velocity of the particle. And, and the, the force depends on the velocity. So then people said, well, wait, that's interesting. What is that the velocity relative to? And they were used to not thinking that it's the absolute velocity. So then, and, and then they said, well, there must be this electromagnetic ether. And the other problem is, if you say that there are these electromagnetic fields, well, what are they? And the natural thought that they had at the time is that they're stresses and strains. But stresses and strains are always stresses and strains in something, right? You can have a stress and strain in a block yeah. of wood, but that's because the wood is there. And, and so insofar as they were trying to understand, this, this really came up, this electromagnetic ether stuff, not surprisingly, came up when Max, with Maxwellian electrodynamics and the discovery of electromagnetic waves and electromagnetic fields. And trying to understand what they were. And one thought was that they had to be mechanical phenomena. And in order to be f mechanical phenomena, they needed a matter there. And the matter was supposed to be this ether. And then they tried to build mechanical models of it using Newtonian mechanics, and that always failed. I mean, they tried and tried and tried to imagine how you could have a mechanical substance that behaved as the ether would have to. But they couldn't. They couldn't make any sense of it because it had to have these weird properties. I mean, for example, the Earth presumably would be constantly moving through this ether, but nonetheless, it's not slowed down. Right. So it had to be no friction. But if there was no friction, then it seems like there ought to be an ether wind as the Earth rotates and and orbits there should always be, we should always be on earth moving through the ether. But then if we're moving through the ether, we might be able to see that with the experiments like the Michelson Morley experiment. And then, but then that came out with negative results. And I mean, there was all stuff about stellar aberration. I mean, there's a lot of technical physics about why they couldn't get the electromagnetic ether to work out the way they wanted to. Uh, and it's eventually in relativity where Einstein says, look, if we change the space time structure, in a certain way. We go very far away from Newton's picture of space and time. But in terms of this new space time structure, which has light cones mm -hmm. in it and stuff, I can write down Maxwellian electrodynamics cleanly, right? I don't need any material ether. I just, 
refer to space and time itself in writing down these laws. And this is the point about Maxwell's equations is that they, are, they, they, as it were, naturally look like they're built for, uh, for Minkowski space time. Hmm. Well, do you get, I mean, returning back to the, to the Newtonian uh, era, I guess, or that time, mm-hmm. were debates about absolute time and relative time tied to the debates about absolute space and relative space? Or is that, is that a completely different uh, issue? I mean, the the only place I know of, and, you know, the I know of here is an important restriction, uh, where this was really discussed was, of course, in in the uh, Leibniz-Clark correspondence, where Clark is defending Newton, uh, and Leibniz is is arguing for a relationship. And Clark was, if if I'm right, he was basically... I mean, didn't Newton just didn't want to talk to Leibniz for so he but he was basically giving Clark everything to say, right? I, it, I, I mean, I've heard that when you read the when you read the thing, the weird thing about it is that the relevant argument, which is the bucket argument that occurs in the scolium to definition eight of Principia. Um, Clark doesn't bring it up until his fourth response. And that sort of suggests to me that Newton wasn't looking over his shoulder or he would have brought it up in the first response, right? I think Newton would have been much quicker to point out. I mean, it it seems to me perfectly possible that at a certain point, Clark consulted Newton and Newton might have given him some good advice about how to respond to Leibniz. Uh, and this is conjectural, but just when I read the correspondence, um, I don't get a sense until the very end. And then Leibniz dies right after the fifth response. So the thing ends. Um, I get I, I don't get a sense that uh, of, of Newton's hand in it so much until the later responses. Um, so I, I, I guess I don't think that 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 um, Clark was just a mouthpiece Right, a front for Newton writing these things, although he may well have been involved at some point. And and that was um, the reason, though, that Clark was involved in the first place. Was it because of like the dispute about who invented the calculus, or am I conflict? No, okay. no, it has nothing to do with that. No, no, it was because Leibniz Leibniz launched an attack saying that Newtonian N- Newtonianism uh, promotes okay. atheism. So completely unrelated. I mean, you can just read the beginning of the course. It has nothing to do with calculus. No, that's like, I mean, calculus doesn't come out into the discussion at all. It has nothing to do with that. It was, it was that, you know, and you just start and read the correspondence. This correspondence doesn't start out about space and time. It starts out about the principle of sufficient reason, uh, which, of course, you can imagine Leibniz harping on the principle of sufficient reason because he thought that was the key to metaphysics, right? Leibniz thought that the the fundamental principle of logic was the principle of non-contradiction and the fundamental principle of metaphysics was the principle of sufficient reason and that you could solve all metaphysical problems by appealing to the principle of sufficient reason. Um, but he also makes these dis- you know, directly disparaging remarks about Newton and the Newtonians and how they're undermining um, good religious virtue by promoting, um, by promoting Newtonian physics. And you know, the thing evolves into this discussion of space and time because of, of Clark trying to give a counterexample to the principle of sufficient reason um, that involves absolute motion. So, I mean, yeah, the, the, it, it's a weird, you know, it's a weird evolution across, across all these letters. Um, and certainly where they end up is quite different from where they began. And I imagine Princess, whoever it was, uh, I can't remember her name, Princess Sophie or something that the, these things are being sent to was getting awfully <laughs> bored by having these two guys argue about absolute space and time. Um, I, I don't imagine it was part of her interest at all. But 
Well, getting back to where where you were going before I cut you off, what was the debate over absolute time and relative time? Well, oh yeah. So what I was going to say was that in, in the the one place where this debate is really carried out, uh, I mean, the two places I guess are one is in Newton's Scolium on space and time, where he lays out his view, and and he just does it in absolute parallel for absolute space and absolute time, right? He he separates them, but he says there is absolute space and there is absolute time, and therefore there is absolute motion, right? And, and then in the debate with Leibniz, um, Leibniz himself does both the spatial and the temporal examples, and he treats them completely in parallel. So I, I don't get the sense that any parties thought that the fundamental issues would go differently for space as they do for time. You can separate them, and you can believe in absolute time without absolute space. And that, to me, that's actually quite a reasonable position. But to my knowledge, nobody was doing that. They sort of thought whatever whatever position they took on space, they would take on time, and vice versa. And were there any particularly compelling thought experiments or real experiments about absolute versus relative time, like the bucket argument for space? Well, because that has to do with motion, you see, the, the bucket argument says there's an absolute fact about whether something is spinning. And spinning is a certain kind of motion. In particular, it's an acceleration. And motion tends to involve both space and time, right? Motion is change of place through time. So in a way until you get very deep into it, it looks like you're dealing with space and time together. Now, you mentioned earlier, okay, so your your metaphysics about the physical part of the world are informed by your physics. And you mentioned earlier that there's we have quantum theory on the one hand, we have relativity on the other, and your your chips at this point are that relativity is going to have to go. And that's what you're working on right now. And what I'm wondering then is, mm -hmm. again, granted that science is far from complete, how this leaves you thinking about what space and what time are if you are presumably not going to be drawing on relativity for that. Or maybe there are portions of it that you're you're still going to keep. There are portions I'm still going to keep. I mean, so the answer to this is kind of straightforward, uh, more straightforward than you'd imagine. Um, Einstein developed the special theory of relativity thinking about Maxwellian electrodynamics and developed the general theory of relativity thinking about Newtonian gravitational theory. And at the time, late 19th century, those were the only two real physical theories there were. Um, and he came up with an account of space and time that was adequate for stating elect, uh, new, uh, Maxwellian electrodynamics and then in general relativity adequate for giving you a theory of gravity or gravitational effects that was, you know, in the limit looked like Newtonian gravity. Um, what he did not have was violations of Bell's inequality, which is what we get out of quantum theory. And what the violations of Bell's inequality tell us is that the world has a kind of non-locality or what Einstein used to rail against as spooky action at mm -hmm. a distance um, as part of it. And so not surprisingly, Einstein's theory of space and time was not designed to be able to account for that because he didn't know it existed. And if you want to account for non-locality, by far the easiest thing to do, the simplest and most direct thing to do, is to go back and put in something like absolute time. Not, absolute, not exactly absolute space, but something like absolute time, an absolute what we call foliation of space-time. Um, and make use of that in, in specifying the physical laws. So I, I've thought for a long time that's the reasonable way to go, just in general. That, that is, I'm going to give up on relativity and reintroduce an absolute foliation. Um, but I don't want to go back to Newton. 
I want to keep things like light cone, sort of like light cone structure. There's a bunch of stuff that you have in relativity that I want to keep. And there are ways to do that. There are various ways to do it. Um, at the moment, I'm going even much deeper or more fundamental and saying, I want to get rid of a continuum and do everything in a, in a discrete structure. So that's what I'm working on right now is a, a discrete space time structure that has an absolute time in it, um, but also something like a light cone structure in it that emerges naturally and try to do everything in terms of that. Two questions then that immediately come to mind are on the one hand, how is it that we sort of get rid of parts or all of relativity when it's been so well experimentally confirmed, like with um, gravitational lensing, for instance. And then the other thing, if we admit absolute time, then how do we account for things like the twin paradox, which granted is, uh, I mean, a thought experiment? No, it's not a thought. I mean, it's actual experiments verify that that's a real like effect. Like with clocks. I mean, and, yeah. And it's accurately sure. predicted. So it's, the, it's uh, I mean, that, that's a physical effect you have to account for. Um, so again, the answer to this is much simpler than you might think. Or, or let me say, there are two steps to this. The simplest answer is to say, in order to deal with quantum non-locality, with violations of Bell's inequality, what I would like is this absolute foliation or slicing of the space-time, right? So I'm going to slice it into these leaves. Um, that Newton gives me with absolute time, and that's something that relativity takes away. It, relativity adds structure to space-time that Newton doesn't have and takes away structure from space-time that Newton does have. So relativity has light cones. Newton doesn't have that. But relativity doesn't have an absolute foliation, and Newton does. So if I want to keep all the resources that relativity have used to make its successful predictions, but also have an absolute foliation, the simple solution is to add an absolute foliation. Done. I still have the light cones. I still have everything. Every relativistic equation I have, I can still write down because I've kept all that structure. I've just added an, an additional piece of structure. And you say, why did you add that structure? Well, because I have some phenomena I need to explain that you can't explain without it or you can't easily explain without it. So abandoning relativity, I mean, most people would say, and I don't object to it, that if I add an absolute foliation, I'm abandoning relativity, that one of the main postulates of relativity is that there's no absolute foliation. So by adding it, I'm happy to say I'm abandoning relativity, but I'm abandoning it not by giving anything up, but by adding something that isn't there, right? By adding to it. And so I don't lose any explanatory resources, and I certainly don't lose any mathematical resources. So that's the first step. If you take the second step, which I want to do, which is to go from a continuum to a discrete structure, then you have to make more radical adjustments. Um, but they're in the same spirit that, yes, I have an absolute foliation, but I also have something like a light cone structure and I can appeal to both of them. And the, um, I, I, the hope is to be able to recover relativity as a kind of um, good approximation. Hmm. Well, I have two more questions about space and time for today. And one of them, I guess I'll, I'll start with, with just a simple example for math. So, I mean, if you have the, the number line from zero to one, you just have this interval uh, and you take any two points, I mean, whether it's uh, the continuum or the rational numbers, you it's dense. So you always find another mm -hmm. um, point between right. them. And I'm wondering if you take space and time as being like this, if you take any sort of linear dimension or some like spatial dimension, if, if it's uh -huh. infinitely divisible or if it's discrete, there's like um, tiniest little divisions uh, and the same with, with time. Right. No, that, that, what I'm working on now is a theory in which it's discrete, in which between any two points there are only finitely many points. Hmm. 
that's what I'm okay. working on now. Cool. Such and what is the what's the motivation for that? Is be, is it is does it have anything to do with not wanting to admit actual infinities in your ontology or no not really i i don't have anything in my guts against there's some people who don't like infinities there's some physicists even some mathematicians for god's sake who don't like infinities i mean who want don't even want infinitely many integers which you know poor you because there <laughs> are um I, it's not that i have anything against infinity per se but there are um technical problems that have come up in physics in terms of singularities, in terms of the equations blowing up, right? It, it, certain equations where the values given back by the equations um, rise without limit. Uh, you know, we say offhand, they go to infinity, and then the equations break down. Uh, and these, these, sing, these are called singularities, and they occur all the time in quantum field theory. And then there had to be a whole bunch of work on something called renormalization to try and get around them, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so these were just technical mathematical problems. You could imagine a continuum, a theory with a continuum where those problems just didn't arise. But in fact, in physics as we have it, they do arise. And if you start with a discrete structure, they can't arise because nothing can ever blow up like that. The blowing up requires a, you know, a dense structure, as you say doesn't really have to be a continuum, but it has to be dense because you can always get closer and closer and closer and the, the values get higher and higher and higher. So, yeah, uh, um, you know, one of the motivations is if you if you're doing a discrete geometry, certain kinds of singularities just are ruled out from the beginning. One, it was just curiosity. I mean, it's obviously possible that space time is discrete. Um, many people somehow gesture and say, Quantum theory tells us it must be discrete, although it doesn't. I don't, you know, there's no nothing much behind that. But um, already Zeno thought they might be discrete and might be continuous. So you know, it could be discrete. Um, it's it's worthwhile to spend some time thinking about how it might be discrete. It turns out there's a lot to think about, a lot of different possibilities, a lot of choices to make, a lot of different structures you can consider. So that's what I've been working on. Um, so some some of it is motivated by the actual problems physics has run into it and some of it is just motivated by curiosity okay and then the last thing i was curious about i guess it's sort of the the flip side of that coin is how you think about whether or not time and for that matter space has well more time i guess has a beginning or an ending and for space i guess it's more whether it has limits so an, an ending mm -hmm. or outer limits yeah, I mean, I guess I'm I'm psychologically prepared for either answer. In okay, so each you're case. agnostic on it. At um, least. I'm agnostic. I I you know, in my guts, I have the feeling that many people have that even though I can't point out a logical contradiction, if you tell me time is infinite to the past. It seems it, it seems creepy. It seems like, well, how how did an infinite amount of time manage to actually elapse? Yeah. Okay. Um, whereas time being infinite to the future, you know, everybody doesn't have a problem with. It's like, yeah, maybe time just keeps uh -huh. going. Um, I, I I do find a, a kind of you know emotional preference for time being limited to the past. <laughs> um, whether space is limited and comes back on itself, right, is closed or just, or continues on infinitely, I'm kind of neutral okay, about. Okay, so you don't have uh, compelling arguments, philosophical or physical, in either direction? No, I would okay. say not. Well, then, the last thing I'll ask on a lighter note, do you have any favorite sci-fi movies? <laughs> Seems like that's a good question to ask a, a physicist who probably has a very keen eye for. Well, sure. I mean, look, my favorite movie, not just sci-fi movies, but one of my favorite movies of all time is 2001. Okay. Yeah. Um, but not so, not, not so much for the science fiction-y elements of it, to tell you the truth. Um, I just think it's a wonderful movie for many cinematic reasons. Um, Maybe something that has more of what you would think of philosophically inflected uh, science fiction elements is is uh, the prestige. I think is really 
who's really no there's enjoyable. two there's two there's oh. the prestige and the illusionist and i get them confused is that the one with hugh jackman um yes <laughs> somebody's listening in i hear <laughs> okay. yes my wife great she knows. yeah i like that one too good twist okay well yeah. thanks so much for letting me pick your brain tim this has been really fun for me and i'm sure it's been okay. fun for my audience too okay well thanks for having me